Well, welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Dave. Hello. How's it going? Dave, what does that sign say in the background? I have... Uh, it's Dave's birthday. One? It's my birthday, yes. Is it? Uh, well, it's it's my birthday tomorrow, but I'm streaming on my birthday tomorrow, so I set that sign up for tomorrow, uh, forgetting the fact that I would be on camera a couple of times today. So, yes, it's one day off my birthday, so... I technically you were literally going to be like oh it's my birthday year i'm like hang on this you know those types of people that are like oh, it's no. my birthday week i'm like that's an attention grab no i don't like that um no it's my birthday tomorrow and i've got a birthday stream on and i figured that, that i'd totally forget it and that that sign normally says the dave cave which is the name of it's the name of my community on twitch so that's um that's what we usually have in the background there what do you do on twitch uh, I'm, a, I'm a mental health streamer. So basically I stream a mental health drop in chat every Tuesday from 10 a.m. till 4 p.m. UK time. Um, so people can come along and talk about mental health and mindset. And um, yeah, and then Saturday nights are normally a little bit more fun. Tomorrow night's going to be a lot more fun because, you know, birthday party, woo <laughs> like 2021 style. Um, in, I don't know what it's like over there, but over here we can't see anyone face to face. So I'm going to see a bunch of people over Zoom and yeah. Um, Got an, um, an American group of comedians coming on called Drinks, Jokes, and Storytelling. So we're going to have some drinks, some jokes, and some storytelling. And uh... especially with um, you said you you know you're a mental health advocate as well. Um, the support of it right now, especially considering all the times that we're going through, like this pandemic, everything. It was crazy to see like the number of like kids that were experiencing depression had increased even with online schooling oh there there are two articles i saw one was about depression another one was about adhd i mm -hmm. think they're conflating adhd with something i don't really think that it's gone up in kids i think it's just really hard to get kids to sit still especially over a computer when you're confined to a classroom so that idea that like kids are now being diagnosed with ADHD more. It's like, it's not ADHD. You just have a kid in his fucking home. And the last thing he wants to be doing is sitting in a classroom, listening to you talk about borons and neutrons and electrons and so on. But the mental health aspect of things was a big thing. I've been talking to, I guess, everyone really about one question is what have you pulled that was good out of the pandemic because there is that side of things when you start to look for that perspective a lot of people have woken up to something inside of themselves that they never thought they would do in the job that they spent 30 years for because there's it seemed like we all thought like our life was in our own hands and then with the job system and everything that kind of shut the, shut us all down, we realized that could all go away in a moment, which mm -hmm. turns into the greater scheme of things, which is looking inside of yourself and trying to find out what that answer is, what that avenue is to go towards, you know, who are you as a person besides like dreams, passions, goals, all these things, you know, it's it was a big question for a lot of people, which I, like, it, I think it's of prime importance, especially now more than ever. I mean, we're a time period where we're at conflicts with each other constantly, but there's a lot of good here on this planet. And it, it starts with trying to find out who you are, because you're not going to be happy to other people if you're not happy with yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, probably the best thing for me to come out of the whole pandemic was moving things over to Twitch before... Before the pandemic, I used to go into schools and teach mental health with a, with an organization called Change Talks. And um, the person who organizes all that, I'm just a speaker for them, but the guy who organized it turned around and he's like, yeah, yeah, we can't go into schools, so what can we do? And that was, um, that was what started the Tuesday stream off. We actually ran something called the Mental Health Family Hour, which basically was a way of communicating between teachers, kids, and parents. Because when we talk, if I was to talk to a group of kids about mental health, you'd be using different language, you'd communicate differently. If you're talking to teachers and parents about it, it's different again. And so much of the, one of the big things that we said back then was, it's just hard because you go and speak to a group of 30 kids. And we'd like, we'd maybe speak to like 30 kids five days a week for like, you know, a series of six weeks or whatever. And, um, you you're only speaking to the kids and maybe if the teacher sits in on it you know you're speaking to one teacher but you know that you're telling them how to go and communicate about their mental health with their parents but the beauty of the mental health family hour was it was a show that that the parents and the kids could watch together and like we actually you know use that to kind of bridge the gap to between between them and, and it is a lot of, a lot of the feedback we get um on the show actually is from parents and carers and stuff and like they're having better conversations but i think 
that was something that we'd always kind of like sat on our hands about for about two years, you know, oh, what can we, what can we do online? Cause we didn't need to do it online. So therefore it was always like, well, that'll get done someday. Do you know what I mean? Whereas it then became a, well, we need to do something right now. What can we do? And um, that became, you know, that became about three weeks after we came up with the idea, the first episode went live and it just, it's been, it's been a very transformative process for both me and my co-host on it, actually winning it. We won an award off the prime minister over here for it. And, and it's got, it's allowed the work that we both do to, to reach a lot more people, which is good because ultimately the power of the work you do is the power of it multiplied by how many people you actually manage to reach with it. So it's good. And there's, yes, mental health is definitely, there's definitely more, there's more issues with it. There's also more awareness of it. So the numbers probably aren't much higher than they were before, but the numbers we know about are now much higher. Plus, and isn't it in the United Kingdom, it's a lot different when it comes to the idea of mental health. A lot of people usually keep that stuff locked up a little bit more than America does, where kind of America exposes it a little bit. Only reason I know that is from some episodes where I've had guests on or if I've said something, you know, I got my own mental health issues as well, much like a large amount of the population of the world does. But like just the feedback on some of it was like, all right, don't need to hear you whine and don't need to hear you saying this. And it's just like, it was, a, it was a different idea of things because I think you guys look at it a little bit differently too. Um, there was a podcast with Dr. Mark Gordon who, st- who helps uh, p- uh, patients with PTSD from uh, trauma or something that they experienced in the war. And when he was over across seas talking about this issue in the United Kingdom, talking about like, you know, PTSD, depression, there's no really a scale of measurement in the UK. The scale of measurement for here is kind of like we have a, a, a list of questionnaires. We have all these types of things that would show a severity of how d- deep in depression you really are, if it's light or if it's severe. But in the UK, it's more about the person's perspective. So it's like if a doctor says, oh, you could be depressed, and that's kind of how they rule it in. Um, we do actually have questionnaires. I mean, I have type 2 bipolar disorder myself, so I get assessed for depression, mania, psychosis on a reasonably regular basis. Uh, but I think it's I think it comes down to obviously the difference in the way that our, the health systems are run really over over here um, when it's like they're much more readily re- available to kind of suppose prescribe someone with antidepressants because that's not the individual that's having to really pay for that. That's not the doctor that's having to pay for that. That's the NHS that's having to pay for that. Um, so so it does get thrown around a little bit more readily. And then things like therapy, we, we, have, we actually have cognitive behavioral therapy on our on our free healthcare, but there's like a six month waiting list for it. Um, I would say that perspective of the of mental health within the UK, it's a little bit more of the older generation. I mean, I'm 39 tomorrow, so I'm, I'm reasonably old, but um, the older generation have that whole stiff upper lip thing. You know, it's very terribly British, you know, of course we'll just keep ourselves to ourselves and not say anything and especially, no, it's all in your head and all, all that stuff. It's, um, there's a lot of that lingering on from the older generation. Um, like I remember talking at a conference about suicide and some person, one of the older guys in the audience came up to me afterwards and was just giving me this speech on his next door neighbor. And he was telling me about all the things that this is next door neighbor are going for him. And he's like, I just can't understand why he killed himself. You know, he's like, he was a dentist. And the first thing he picked up was he was a dentist and he was on tons of money. And first of all, I mean, I don't know what the statistics are exactly, but dentists are actually quite high up on the list in terms of people who take their own lives. But, um, he was like, I just don't get it, you know, yeah. And it's and that's the thing about there's a little bit of a backdated idea of mental health in that. But I would say it's actually changing quite a lot now. I have a reasonably biased point of view on it because I work within the mental health community. So I end up spending a lot of time with people who are working up towards the removal of the stigma. I mean, I do spend a lot of time speaking to the general public, but that was a really weird thing for me when the when the pandemic started, is again, is um I've gone from going to, when we do a live events now, it's over Zoom. So we do the live event, we do some Q&A, and then we disconnect. We don't, we don't mingle or chit chat or hang about and talk to people between speakers or anything like that. We just, you just sit at your desk and, you know, then you commute us to your bedroom, which is four meters away or whatever. But um, often before that, we'd sit and have those type of conversations, but you'd be speaking to people from almost not quite an echo chamber, but still people that were actually out there trying to reduce the stigma. And then it was only when when the pandemic hit and like the first time our lockdown, 
eased. We were able to kind of like see one or two friends at a time. So you'd start, I'd start, start having friends over again. And I'd not vented about mental health for like four months at this point. Normally when I go and speak at an event, I'll vent to someone, you know, you'll meet other people that the best way to say it is they just get it. So you end up like having a back and forth and, and, and about stuff and you get that stuff out of your system. And I remember a couple of my friends coming over last year and I hadn't got any of that stuff out of my system for a few months. So I obviously start getting it out of my system with them. And I was like, oh, this is different. Like the way I'm having to conduct this conversation with them, I'm having to preface a lot of things. I'm having to explain things more. I'm having to like explain my viewpoint on things and step to one side and reiterate things and all the rest of this. And the amount of work that went into having a conversation, trying to explain the principle. I even remember the conversation. I was trying to explain the principle of if someone's in crisis and you're dealing with that, don't expect them to act like the one that's not in crisis. You have to be the one that acts like they're not in crisis. Um, because it's like, you know, it's like you tell people, calm down. You tell people, get a hold of yourself. You, you ask the person to start thinking rationally. They're in crisis. They're not going to. If I explain that concept to a bunch of people in the mental health sphere, it's not even explain. We just, everyone just nods and we move along with the conversation. But I, I was trying to explain this to these two friends. And it was like a 90 minute conversation where almost bordering on an argument. And um, like, obviously they wanted to, their point of view is like, well, the person on, who's having the crisis should be more like this. I'm like, they, it's not that they should or shouldn't be more like that. It's like, they can't. If a person has got to the point of either having a panic attack or even worse than that, having, you know, having a psychotic episode or, you know, to the point of which they feel like they want to take their own life, they're not going to think rationally and you trying to logic them into it, it's not going to work. You're expecting that person that's already stretched to the end of their capabilities to go 5% further. I'm asking you to go 5% further because you've got more of your capabilities still left intact. And yeah, as I say, it just outside of the mental health community, that's a very tough pill to swallow. Um, that's, because it's, a, it's, a, it's weird because that's an understandable concept like that's not hard to grasp for a lot of people but the issue is just like is it the factor of trying to i i understand with depression especially if like if you have depression trying to explain to someone what that is or what that's like there's that's there's it's like saying you have adhd or something and then trying to explain it so i have adhd too it's like do, do you know what that is though like that actual experience you know people don't really can't understand it unless they're experiencing it themselves but yeah especially when you're in a panic state too when you're going it, we focus a lot on trying to fix the problem of like, how do we make sure that you don't have another panic attack? And a lot of that, especially in the industry, I would say they're giving you a pill or something to make sure you get prone to less panic attacks. Why don't you eliminate the fucking problem of what's causing the panic attacks? <laughs> it's the same thing. Like um, I was listening to this uh, professor, his name is Dr. Carl Hunt, and he was talking about how addiction's kind of like fake. And I went to school for chemical dependency. So I was like, hang on a second. I'm already biased to it's a real thing thing but he was explaining that the addiction to a drug it's not the drug it's you're addicted to the thing that's getting you off of the feeling of what is making you miserable same thing why like rehabs are kind of bullshit on the aspect of they're treating you for a heroin addiction but they're not treating the core problem which is why you went to heroin in the first place which is just yes. means you're going to turn to another drug that's why most of the people that go into these rehab facilities end up getting for, uh, hooked onto another addiction or something a food addiction a cigarette addiction a drinking addiction something like that because they haven't fixed the core problem like if i burn down if my house burns down then i go to cocaine and then i go to rehab for cocaine i'm my house is still fucking burned down it's still a pile of ash and it's depression there and it through talking with so many people and getting so many different perspectives, I started to realize that we're all thinking on the same basis of things, but we're not talking, we're not communicating. And that's the first aspect of the war of whatever of this social media conflict and this fire starter thing that we all live in right now. And that's the aspect of we're not talking to each other in the proper forms anyway. Methods you used to come home after a long day and talk to a family member, talk to a close friend that used to hear all your things and sit there and like, okay. Are, you feel better now? It's like, I, I do. I do feel better. And I feel like a, a hug for my soul because I'm here for you. If you ever need anything that just those words have now empty. They're just empty. 
there's there's nothing there. A lot of the times someone will say that on social media, but how many people will actually sit there and listen to you and actually hear your thing? But it's also a give and take, I believe. I believe if you're going to say all your problems onto someone, you have to be ready to accept theirs as well. So that means they get a chance to unload onto you because I believe this world is so stressful now that it's not just one person suffering. I think everyone's slowly suffering and then sooner or later somebody cracks and that's when they freak out and have this panic attack and have this because I, I can give myself panic attack easy by just sitting in my driveway. I was doing it by thinking about my blood going through my heart and I really amplified it in my head and I just started <laughs> having to lie down for a minute because the room was spinning. I thought I was going to die. Um, but when it comes to talking with people, I think initially everyone has this love and admiration and a care for each person, no matter your color, no matter what. But we get so binded up by our own perspectives of things, it's hard for us to tear those down and be able to connect with someone that doesn't either doesn't look like us, doesn't live near us, or isn't infected into our everyday life. Yeah. And it was especially the best moment of my life, which was just the other day when I saw hashtag delete Facebook trending on Twitter. I lost my <laughs> shit. I was like, thank you. Finally, we're understanding how social media is now become this crutch. It's this weird thing. I was listening to case studies from surgeons that were talking about back in the day. If I put you under in surgery and you woke up from surgery, first thing you would check, do you know what you would check as a person? Do you know, can you take a shot in the dark? Well, historically, like you check um, how you got on with the surgery. Well, back you, then, first thing you're checking is your dick. Okay, you're, check, <laughs> you're checking if that's still there. That is out of the case study, the research study that they did. That ninety percent of males, when they got out of surgery, first thing they checked was if their dick was there. They did this study ten years later when the cell phone became now a lot of a bigger trend. The study now is that first thing people check when they wake up from surgery is their cell phone. They check for their phone. They check for their, that little device that is in our pocket 24 seven that we could literally, we don't need a tether to because it's somehow tethered to us mentally. So oh, yeah. hearing <laughs> that it shows like when that delete Facebook thing hit, I was like, finally, we're starting to see that most conflicts happen on social media. You can use it in a positive. You can use it as a benefit to do a Zoom call like me and you are doing. But mm -hmm. that's not fun for a lot of people. What they want to do is they want to type something in on Twitter that's going to outrage a bunch of people who are fans of Elon Musk because they can. And yeah. that's that's the issue is when someone puts an opinion or someone puts in their perspective on something, when it's written through text, it's very different than when you talk to that person. They could be talking to it just like how I'm doing it, where I'm like, hey, Dave, I love you. But if I type that in on a Twitter thing and it says, Dave, love you, you're like, are you being condescending to me? Are you being this? It's like, no, I'm legit telling you I love you. And then next thing you I, know, I actually history. literally, I literally made a piece of content on this a couple of days ago. Um, and I said, right, say the, um, Say the following phrase. Um, I saw you out on Saturday night and you looked really good. Now say that phrase twice. Say it the first time in the voice of your best friend and the second time in the voice of your arch nemesis. And when you say it as your best friend, it's like, oh, I saw you out on Saturday night. You were looking really good. And then the arch nemesis is like, oh, I saw you out last on Saturday night. You were looking really good. It's the exact same words. Now, Twitter, we we create a character upon, we look at the person's you know avatar and then if it's the first time we've seen that person, if we know that person, we've got a relationship with them, then we take it one way. But if we've not, we've not got, we're not going to spend years going and researching every single one of their tweets to see, are they a sarcastic person? Are they a genuine person? Are they a little bit satirical or like, you know, are what they say in a little bit tongue in cheek, whatever. It's like, we're not looking to find the nuance of that. We're looking at that picture, reading that assigning an avatar in our own head of how that person's voice sounds and how that person intends it. And the intention isn't necessarily the same as um, the same as actually what, well, I said the way I said it on the video was, is a very big difference between what is implied and what is inferred. You know, they might be implying one thing, whereas we infer something else. I mean, let's look at, like, if we even go to like when Black Lives Matter came back up, Black Lives Matter was what was being said. What was being heard was all lives don't. Like no one was saying all lives don't. No one was saying white lives don't, right? People were just saying Black Lives Matter. But you know, our side of the community was hearing white lives don't. Some people in our side of the community, should I say, not all of us, but but people were hearing that even though it wasn't being said. And that's, that's one of the big problems with social media is the fact that we don't know the person that's saying that. Like, 
like you know we don't know the person that's out there as you say like slagging off Elon Musk or whatever it might be but the thing is we're all tr- I think that anything that gets put on social media is done for attention now actually I really think everything's done for connection which is what we really want but most of us have forgotten how to get connections so and, and attention is the gateway drug to connection right we actually want to communicate like you and I you and I are now we want to be able to have real conversations but it's hard because you have to organize a time and you have to get past certain social boundaries and you have to make a certain level of a relationship. And it's the same. I, honestly, I've worked for the last seven years on social media, putting my, well, personal development content out, which started off as physical personal development content and moved into mental personal development content. I've been putting that stuff out. See, the ability to have an impact with that, that video that I put up there, it's like, it's had, it put it up yesterday. It's had like 23 views on YouTube. A few people have liked it. Cool. Right. That's great. That video took me two hours to make, edit, put up all the rest of it. It would take me five seconds to go out there right now and say fuck and then put a person's name after it. Pick anyone's, you know, fuck, you know, fuck Elon Musk, fuck Trump, fuck, you know, fuck Boris Johnson. Like, which I could literally. Boris Johnson. He's our prime minister. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, don't, I won't say that because I don't want him to take my award away. But um but basically, I, if I went out there right now, and let's say, like, let's, let's go with something random. The new, uh, you know, Emma Stone, the new Cruella de Vil film, has just been, uh, people are loving it. She thinks she's laying If I went out there and said, fuck Cruella de Vil, right? The amount of response I would get on that is so much greater than any post that I've put up so far. Because because it get dogpiled on by a bunch of people that are either pro Cruelzeville or pro Emma Stone or think that I'm being misogynistic. You know, I might just hate the character, but people have think that I was doing it because I'm a dude and Cruella Deville's, a, you know, a fierce femme fatale. Basically, there's loads of different reasons why people might think I'm posting that, and all these people that would see it because it propagates through more and more people's news feeds. Then I get dogpiled on even more, and the, this is how things become viral. And it's it's so easy to get attention for the wrong reasons. It's very hard to get attention for the right ones. And if, if we are craving attention, which again, I really think we're craving connection, we're craving feeling like we have the ability to make an impact in this world. And every single one of us does have the ability to make an impact in this world. But the problem is again, to make a negative impact, to cause outrage, so easy, piece of cake. And, and the thing is, as humans, sometimes we take the instant gratification. Sometimes we take the easy option. Like we talked, you talked about addiction before, like drugs, alcohol, these are instant gratification. Food, it's an instant gratification. Porn, it's an instant gratification. You know, it's that, and we're, and we're so about primed. 30 seconds or a minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, do you know what I mean? So, so that's why I think that's, and that's the thing is that social media can, um, it's, you could spend, you could spend years building up an amazing community on social media, which is the most positive thing in the world. And then you could say one stupid thing and it could all come crumbling down. I mean, and by you know, stupid, you'd probably have to say something horrible. But, um, but that's the thing. It's so easy um, to actually cause destruction. And it's very, very difficult to be a creator. It's crazy because I talked for a long time about like it, it. I agree with you. It's a lot more about attention than it is having conversations, even though we want that to be the aspect of things of having a conversation. But it's also the idea like how many people just scroll through other people's Facebook posts looking for arguments and fights and just sit there and like them like, dude, you like the comment of mine from eight days ago. That fight is over with. You've already made up and like everything like that. And he's like, oh, I just saw it in my news feed. It's like you're they're just they're searching and they're watching in the wings and looking for that and feeding off of it like this weird like it gets that i'd say this what happened when uh, reality television just stopped really being a popular thing because back in the day you used to come home after like not having a conflict or just having an average day and you're like i feel empty like it just mm-hmm. I, and then you sit on your couch and turn on jersey shore and next thing you know you're like oh my god horrible people and you turned it off but it was that aspect <laughs> if it filled a void it's why jerry springer was so popular i mean i was watching oh, yeah. jerry springer the other day and i'm like who the fuck would go on this show who would <laughs> Who would be so – but you get to see the audience react and laugh and do all these things because it's entertainment, and that's when it all started going down the slippery slope was now that we're feeding off that negative violence as entertainment. I know so many people that do uh, podcasts just calling out random crap that people that don't even know who they are, like just random famous people, people that tweet at random famous people. Um just for the aspect of like they feel like that's going to get a, a bunch of likes, a bunch of people are going to feed off that fighter, that energy. I know one dude was like it's good content. I'm like – 
is that what you want though? Like, do you want to be known as this negative Nancy where every time someone tunes into your thing, sometimes you want to hear a debate, but I don't want to hear a fight. I don't want to hear people yelling and turning into this bitter, resentful argument, but it's like we, when we choose to rely on Facebook, for instance, when mm -hmm. someone puts up a social media post saying that they had a rough day, they're looking for attention. That's okay because you need someone to talk to because you might not have somebody in your own life. But the issue is when you put up that post and it gets one like, and the next day you put up another post, two likes, then let's say three, three, four days down the line, three likes, four likes, five likes, six likes. Then you post again on that eighth day or something and you only get one like, you start mm -hmm. thinking the world fucking hates you and nobody wants to help you and you're all alone again. And then it makes you delete the post and it makes you start questioning who your friends are and it makes you start going down this weird freaking mind rabbit hole. And it's like people are self-sabotaging themselves and the idea that you're creating a reality that isn't true. Not on purpose, but it's just the way that everything is set up for you now to be able to do that is you're making assumptions without understanding what that person means because 70 times, 70 percent of the time your assumptions are correct. The person did mean that joke or whatever like that, but then there's that off chance that they didn't mean that and you take it the wrong way, then you cause out then that person makes an assumption it becomes into a fight happened on Twitter to me the other day when um. Someone posted up on their podcast page, leaving this podcast, making my own private page. I put up a little gif of baby Yoda and I was like, we'll miss you. And they thought it was sarcasticness. And I was like, no, 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 no. I, I legit meant that. And a minute later, she was like, oh, wait, I, I get it. I, I'm sorry. I, I overreacted. I was like, yeah, I was like, I'm not like so many people you might have already met that have done that sarcastically. I'm legit saying I well, I'll follow you on your next profile or whatever like that. But it's those assumptions is that people really don't want to take the time to find the root evidence. They will, don't want to find out who this person is, which makes it horrible for me and you doing a podcast or something because somebody could take a clip or take a, a picture of you doing something and meme it and gif it into something that turns into this thing that makes you look like an anti whatever. And that's an issue. But I feel like people shouldn't just run with that as their first result. You don't do one study or one scientific study and just be like that's what it, i f i threw a coin up in the air and it landed on heads that means it's always going to land on heads heads yeah. gravity no you do a number of trials you do a number of different cases to make sure that that is there's a probability that you'll get more heads than tails on a monday or something that's a <laughs> random ass study but it's called you did the trials nobody wants to go and find out that information which is an issue with um why i love that australia is banning google that is perfect because when you type in stuff to google you get your first top result and that's usually what you click is the top result well now they're finding out that google's paying certain companies that are paid partnerships to be the top result so that means the real information could be three or four pages in before you actually see like the actual truth to it all which is an issue it starts creating like i believe right now in society the world is becoming schizophrenic with the amount of stuff that's out there right now you don't know whether to trust your government don't know whether or not to trust your government every time someone says something it turns out to be the opposite and then it's like this and that and this and that i'm like eventually you wonder why people aren't going to leave their fucking homes it's because it's scary as hell trying to go out into the world right now before you used to worry about like i got to get food for my family or something like that now it's oh my god somebody's talking shit on me on twitter on instagram on facebook i have to check it every 30 fucking seconds to keep refreshing it oh my god are they still <laughs> talking about me i lost my sleep and it's like ah uh, I, it's like you start hearing all this stuff and you start seeing it. And you're like, Oh my God, like we're it's headed down a bad road and it needs to take a turn. That's why I was so happy when I saw delete Facebook, I was like, Oh, maybe this is that, that pause, that break we need. You know what I mean? It took 10 months during this pandemic for people to see Hawaii's oceans to start coming back. The coral started regrowing and the fish started coming back because nobody was able to swim in the ocean. It sucks. It took a pandemic to make that happen, but maybe a break from social media. I had, friends i've been seeing take these breaks and they come back like i feel so much fucking better i was like yeah it gets weird when you start looking at that follower count and loving it like oh my god i got a i lost a follower what happened oh my god how did i lose a follower it gets crazy man yeah i mean i i find it very interesting the people that i see on twitter that actually say oh such and such unfollowed me i'm like i don't how do you even you have to go to third party software to find out who's unfollowing you that's you even actually, weirder you have to go looking for this information and it's like okay what 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 are you going to do with that information um i remember speaking to someone about like 
we ask you we often ask in the schools like do you kind of like delete posts if you don't get too many likes or do you do you compare how many likes you get on one post to another and stuff and that, now i can honestly say that i do do that however there's two different mindsets of doing that and i i actually liken this i grew up with an eating disorder and for at one point in my life looking at the weight on the scales was an extremely emotional response and another point in my life when i was getting when i got more into fitness when i was older and it body was dysmorphic so it, well no it was a it was a data response at that point i just saw the number and didn't really feel too much about it and i'd weigh myself like once a week or whatever but when i was going through the body dysmorphia side of things i'd be weighing myself multiple times a day and it, like you know seeing what in what in the day would up and down that number you know having like hot baths and all the rest of that to kind of to to bring that anything to bring that number down and there was a point last year which i never had this problem for years with social media but there was a point last year again probably the first few months of lockdown didn't have as much to do that i found myself just refreshing every single one of my things on social media and um and caring about it and it only took me about two weeks to go this is really not good for me so i actually i i had a kind of a call on on checking the statistics now because i'm running a business you still def you want that growth but i need to i need to want the growth rather than need the growth you know like you know it's basically it's a it's a business metric as opposed to an emotional response but um whenever we ask this to kids so uh, the, one of the most interesting answers we ever got back is actually i pay more attention to who hasn't hit like and at that until that point, i'm like i've never even thought about that i've not i've just i've looked at the number i've got i've noted i've observed oh yeah such and such liked it but i've never gone through the full list of likes to find out who his who, who isn't liking it and I'm like, okay, you're now actually specifically going to look to see who isn't liking it. And we're creating this story in our head about the fact that that person hates us and or, would, or that person is ignoring us. It could just be that that person didn't get the post come up in their feed. It could just be that at that point in the, 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 the day, the person was in a, you know, in a bad place themselves and wasn't hitting like on anything. There's loads of different reasons to it. But um, my, I, this is a whole experience called filling in the blanks that we do is we have a little bit of information and we create an entire story out of it. Now, you're probably too young to remember just having a landline, a house phone, you know, not having a mobile, right? But my generation, if, we, if, we, if someone phoned us on the house phone on a Friday night, and also oh, if we phone someone else on a Friday night after school on the, on the house phone, you know, you only got one of them. Remember the big long cords that you go everywhere. You have to ask to see the person because usually the parent <laughs> picked up. Well, yeah, but if no one picked up, what would be the first thing that you thought? It'll leave a message. They're probably well, dead, leave, though. They're probably dead. <laughs> well, that's quite grim. Um, but more often than not, we go, right, they're busy, they're out, there's no one there, they're on the toilet because we didn't take our phones in the toilet in the 90s. Um, you know, it's like, oh, some people did. But it's... Uh, don't it, knock that, because I watched Avengers Endgame when I was in the bathroom. So I'm saying... The whole does, thing! Yes, I when I go to the bathroom, it is an event, and I like to make sure I don't have anything planned for the rest of the day. <laughs> Okay, that's the um, that's going to the top of the list of strange places that people have watched Endgame. Great film though, um, but so so basically we just assume that the person was busy or the person wasn't there, and you know what we do is we put the phone down and we go back to our we go back to our life. We don't we forget that we even phone them about ten minutes later. We go and watch whatever soaps were on TV on a Friday night or whatever it was. Have our dinner, you know, maybe go maybe phone a different friend, whatever. Right. And the whole and then the whole thing would go, you go off without events. You'd see the person on Monday and back in school. You'd be best friends. Every, no problem. Right. No story. They're busy. End of story. Done. Now, this whole thing came along, the good old cell phone. As um, soon as we phone someone on this and they don't answer, the very best thing you're going to think is they're screening me. There or the, the next, but more likely, more likely so we're going to say true. It's but, so but, true. If, if you phone and they don't answer, they're ignoring me. And then we go beyond that to the hate me. Now, if we phone them a couple of times, they still don't answer. We don't stop there. We go over to WhatsApp. Hi, been trying to get hold of you. Give me a shout when you're free. One great tick, two great ticks, two blue ticks. Ooh, another piece of information. We've now they've now seen the thing because the blue ticks tell us that they've seen the thing, right? So now we sit there waiting. Sometimes it'll say is typing, you know. Um, we sit there waiting, they're definitely going to message you back. Def and then what? If the message doesn't come back then, now we definitely think they hate us. Though they've seen the message, with at least before there was a shadow of doubt that they hadn't seen the missed call yet, right? But we're not going back to getting on with our life. We're checking this thing every few seconds. Even if it's there with sounds on, you pick it up to look at it just in case you missed one of them by accident because your attention was elsewhere. 
And then, and this is a little bit different now because we're not all out the house, but back when we were, people would go beyond that and then go onto like Instagram, go into the person's story, see what the person's doing right now. How long ago was it? They were at Chipotle with Diana at like 15 minutes ago. And Diana's an absolute beep. I can't believe they're out with her instead of me. Why would they choose going out with her over me? I've been trying to get hold of him for half an hour. And what she got that I haven't got, we we add in all the extra bit of the story. And this is the whole thing now. <laughs> The problem is, it's like, now, once I've told everyone this story, I usually turn around and say, right, so have you ever been, have you ever uh, been in a situation where you've just got a message from someone and it's kind of, it takes a little bit more than a yes or no answer. You answer, you pick it up, you look at it and you go, oh, okay, I'll respond to that a little bit later when I've got the time. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, that sounds familiar. And then I'm like, ever forgotten. And everyone in the room, when I used to tell this, the whole face is like, oh my God. I was like, I'm like, so the other person thinks that you hate them probably. Now I'm not trying to say this to make you think that like message people back immediately. I'm trying to actually influence the person that's sending the message in the first place. If you send a message and someone doesn't get back to you, go back to the old school, put the phone down and go about the rest of your day. And if they get back to you, they get back to you. But the thing is, we have this bias towards, just like that that girl, that's when you said, you know, we will miss you. She's biased towards negativity. She's biased towards thinking you're being sarcastic. So she assumes a sarcastic intent. And then as a result of that, she's like, oh, Robbie is being, Robbie's being a knob or, you know, Robbie's being this, he's being hor horrible to me. And now I feel bad. And she, she felt bad because of something that actually hadn't even happened. Like, so, but this is the thing. If we think that the person hates us, it doesn't matter if they do or they don't. We feel it and what we feel matters. So if we went from the Friday evening finishing school until the Monday morning, when you see that person in school again, that's four days where you've, you've not sat there going, okay, they hate me. I'll just get along with the rest of my day. It's like, you've obsessed over it for four days. Then you see them in school on the Monday morning. Oh, hi, how's it going? Yeah, it's going great. Yeah, oh, sorry. Oh, I saw your message come through, but I, I didn't answer it when I, when I opened it. And then because I didn't have the notification, I forgot, which every single one of us has done that. I, if, if it's the notification, I have to leave things undone. If it's an email, it's good because you can remark it as a, you can read it and then remark it as unread. I wish I could do that with my WhatsApps. Remarking them as unread so I get a notification back on them because if I do not deal with things there and then, um, then they don't get done. Like if I see the notification and open it and then, then that little red dot's gone, game over. But the way if if just in the worst not even the worst case scenario the worst case scenario is you thought that they hate you all weekend and they actually do that's your worst case scenario but your second worst case scenario is that you thought that they hate you all weekend and they don't because you've spent an entire weekend feeling like someone hates you now if they do hate you and you spend the entire weekend feeling like they don't hate you then first of all you've not lost those three days then when you see them on the monday morning they go up and go, oh, hi, I've been trying to get hold of you all weekend. All weekend. And they go, yes, I know. I hate you. Goodbye. And then I know, obviously, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But the thing is, if they do hate you, then you've got three days between seeing them again, like finding out for sure that you can actually act like they don't. And then if you find out, cool, you've not suffered for those extra three days. It's not changed the outcome, it's, but it's changed how you felt in those three days. Now, the problem is that's just that's one interaction. Imagine you've sent six people different messages and then now you've got an entire bloody weight of the world on your shoulders because all six of them haven't responded and now your story is everyone hates me. How many people have you heard that say everyone hates me or no one likes me? We generalize into it. So like we, have, we get enough evidence. Two or three people don't reply to us. Two or three people unfollow us. But like, you know, you've got 600 people still following you. Like it's 500, you know, you've got 597 of them left. It's like, it's like, it's 597 friends, um, you know, yeah. full on sarcasm on friends, but <laughs> is that, is that you not want enough? real followers? You go to where the homeless population is, you give them a sandwich because they'll legit kill for you. If you feed them, I'm just saying, I've said it before. It's a great way to start a cult. That's what everyone is right now. <laughs> everyone is literally on social media. Technically your profile is like your own cult. You have your followers, you have all these things and you, you, you put up a message and then your followers read your message and they praise your message with a love or a retweet or whatever the hell it is. And when I started noticing how much I was caring about followers where I was refreshing it and like looking at it, like, wow, my number went down. I just, I start doing a thing now, post and ghost where I legit post and I don't go on social media for the rest of the day. I get messages constantly. Yeah. We're at a time difference, a times of difference. 
time difference in Australia, all. So when I'm sleeping at two o'clock in the morning, my phone's blowing up with messages from people that I've reached out to and stuff, which makes it part of the podcast issue that I have. But at the same time, I know I'm not going to let this thing hold me down all day. I need to go mm-hmm. off and do better things. I need to go off and do, and by better, I mean just errands or something to keep my, myself happy, to go, go out to the store, or go out into the world and experience things. It's, it is part of a crutch with I have to post every day, but on the concept of you can use it in the right way, but make sure it's in a healthy way where you can have a day where, you know, if you want to talk to people that you need to talk to, tell them, send them a text, do something that's more immediate rather than needing Instagram or all these other things, but then yeah. retweeting and liking. I never care if anybody retweets my stuff. I don't care if anybody likes my stuff. I'm just posting it. So you know that it's there. I don't care if you, if I even tell people I post what way too many um episodes. So for you to catch up to every single one, I wouldn't put that on anybody. Catch the ones you feel like you want to watch. And then there, there you go. I it, I do this because I've gained more perspective of it because you need to start not thinking selfishly, but thinking about what's the right road you need to be taking in your life and going into Facebook and putting up a meme of depression that everyone can relate to and like it. Like, uh, I, I get that. I, I feel that way too. It's like a, ha, 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 that type of laugh. Mm-hmm. That's not super healthy. That's not healthy at all. You need to find connections with people where I feel like we can create a more positive social media with a little bit of time off of it. Because when you come back to it and realize how crazy you're acting, that's just that that craziness is just a rabbit hole to drag you down into your depression. It's it, people talk about depression and they're like, well, the good thing I never had to experience that. You can't say that. You can't say that until you're dead. Because you can get depression at any age. It can hit you yeah. whenever. It could just be a random moment. Sometimes it clicks into your head and you realize, I have my good days and I have my bad days. When it's those bad days, you look for someone. But when you know that you can rely on a couple people to get you through those tough times. I had a friend call me, he, ex-Power Ranger, amazing dude. He was on my podcast a couple of times. Called me saying, I feel fucking hate my job i don't want to be here in anymore and when we did a podcast on it then after that podcast he quit his job and messaged me a, of an eagle and i'm like what's that mean and he goes i'm free i'm like congratulations <laughs> man but I, we sat there and talked about it it was an emotional episode but we talked through it and that's what everyone needs i told him i wouldn't even post it but he was like no post it people need to hear this type of stuff we all have those connections i always tell people the good way for me to talk about this is what's one cent sense you would be afraid to lose and a lot of people say vision hearing all these other types of things mine's my sense of touch because knowing that i can feel my fingerprints right now if i truly pay attention and then also this desk that is in front of me and my feet into the ground or whatever it lets me know i'm connected and it brings me more into the moment because i do have adhd and i'm all over the place so it helps me get out of my thoughts for a second and feel grounded. And there's these methods that we could be using besides uh, prescription drugs. I had Mm -hmm. a Zoloft that was um, prescribed to me. It's still sitting in my car from when he prescribed it a couple months ago. And it was the aspect of you marked 24 out of 25 on the severe depression test. And we're starting to worry about you. And I cracked a joke, which kind of my bad. Um, I'm a, you get my personality. Well, I had a new doctor this day and she was, um, from, I guess, Russia or Bulgaria. And she was, you know, new, new patient record asking me questions and stuff. And I was like, she was like, you ever, you know, think about killing yourself or anything. And I was like, sometimes I look at a ceiling fan when it's spinning really fast. And I wonder what happens if I jumped into that as like a joke, I said it like (laughs) that. And she goes, and then I read the report and the report was like, patient says he wishes he could and it was just awful and i was like oh my god it made me come out like a psychopath and um first of all i looked that up too and the french have a term for it it's called calling into the void when you look on a top of a building and you look over and you're it's, there's a thought that goes what happens if i fell from here yeah people think that's severe depression it's called calling into the void and it's a rare phenomenon that happens when you're in a tall place i'm just saying that out there because so people know you're not fucking crazy. Just there is there is a huge difference between people thinking about suicide and having full on suicide ideations, yeah. like and it's and the thing is like 
just literally contemplating suicide or contemplating things like, like jumping into a ceiling fan. I'm, honestly, until you mentioned it, and I've probably had that, I've, well, I've definitely had that thought. I've never really thought about the fact that I've had that thought, but I've always looked at things and, and wondered about how they could hurt me and all the rest of that. Because you see so many movies where that scenario happens, you wonder what happened, <laughs> it happened right now. Yeah, um, but like, and you know, those type of thoughts, are, are they're obscenely common, like really common. The number of people that have those thoughts, like, you know, driving down the highway, what happens if I just suddenly turn the wheel right now? It is really, really normal for people to have those thoughts. And some people have those thoughts and then go into this rabbit hole of, well, I'm having that thought. What does that thought say about me? And the problem with depression is it's so easy to be depressed about being depressed. Like I said, it's easy to be anxious about being anxious. It's easy to be stressed about being stressed. You know, you start, you notice how depressed you are. And now suddenly you're quite depressed about it. Like I, to be fair, I woke up this morning feeling strangely odd. This is my first ever birthday in lockdown tomorrow and all the rest of it. And I've got, yeah, I've got this stream party booked and all the rest of it. I'm really excited. And I've got, I've had a really good day today in terms of stuff that I've got planned. You know, I knew I was speaking to you this afternoon got another cool interview later on and um, talking about the new one division show with a bunch of people and it's like i've got some fun stuff in there today as well and i know i've got pizza and beer tonight so you know it's like loads of things to look forward to but i just just like feel strangely not myself earlier in the day like just and now if i just i if i just sat there and dwelled on that for too long we first of all we get into this question what's wrong with me right now if i ask you what's wrong with me even though we've not met you'd be like there's nothing wrong with you you're, you know you're a good guy it's fun to talk to you all the rest of it and whatever you, you give me some compliment back of some description right if a friend said that to you you'd say there's nothing wrong with you you're awesome blah blah, blah. we'd say good things when we ask ourselves that question we only answer it with three different types of answers. And it, it may as well be like inviting three different sets of trolls into our life because the first set of answers is everything bad that we've ever thought about ourselves. The second one is everything bad that anyone else has ever said to us. And then the third one, which is nice and fun and shows you the way the human brain works is everything bad that no one else has ever said to us, but we know that they're thinking it. So like, you know, John down the road thinks I'm an absolute arsehole. It's like, does he? Has he ever said that? No, but I know he's thinking it. I've seen the way he looks at me. Now, if you imagine like we talked about with negativity on social media, if you had three sets of trolls come into your post and be like, if you put up a post saying, what's wrong with me on social media? And like three groups worth of people came in, one telling you everything bad you've ever thought about yourself one saying repeating oh here's a tweet about you from six years ago where someone thought you were an absolute douchebag it's like you know if, and then and then just one confirming all the our suspicions that of what other people have thought about us it'd be the most depressing thing in the whole world and yet our brain is answering that question when we say what's wrong with me i like that's the number one banned question with everyone i work with we don't we, if we find ourselves asking that question we realize you no know, that's only going to drag me down even further Instead, or even why can't I do this is like the gateway to that question. I teach people say, you know, say, how could I do this? How, say, what could I do to move forward? And what could I do to move forward might mean actually sit with these feelings, accept them, let them pass. It might mean go and get some therapy. It might mean speak to a friend. But when we don't answer that question, dig, dig into that question, our answers are usually, again, going back to those instant gratification things, things that make us feel good and escape that feeling straight away. But the thing with that this morning is we have, we have thousands of thoughts every single day, like maybe even more than thousands, you know, like, and I may have thought something good about myself earlier. I may have thought, actually, I, I went for a run earlier and I, I had COVID earlier in the year. It's my fourth run since COVID and it's the best one of the four. So I probably definitely thought something good about myself after coming back from that run, but I didn't hold on to that feeling. Now, if I felt weird about myself, it, like later on, but I hold on to that feeling. It's not the thoughts that we have that cause problems. It's the ones that we hold on to. So which one, like if, if I was to offer you an insult and a compliment, like depending on which one of them you came off the end of this call holding on to, if you held on to the insult, you'd be like, that Dave was an absolute free. Um, if you held on to the compliment, you'd be like, like chatting to that Dave guy. <laughs> you know, it's like, you feel good. And it's, and it's the ones that we hold on to, but we do have this bias towards the negative. It's actually literally built into our brains. It's called negativity bias and it's supposed to keep us safe. It was supposed to keep us safe when there was a saber tooth tiger there. And we thought, holy shit, let's not go up and pet this thing. Let's actually sharpen the spears, lock the doors, get the kids to safety and, and protect ourselves. Now, like it could just be someone saying, you know, you look really good today on social media. 
And the negativity bias kicks in and says, what do you mean today? Do you mean I don't normally love God? I didn't even fucking think of that one. <laughs> oh my goodness. But that's on, honestly, that's the, this, that's the way our brain works. And almost what you said earlier was actually, was really good when you said, I, I love that post and ghost thing, by the way. Um, I'm totally stealing that. Um, I, I recommend people do that. I say, first of all, we want to we want to go on to, onto social media either to create, to curate, um, to connect or to consume. But whichever one of those four that we go with, we want to make sure that's why we're going there. So if I'm going to consume, yeah, I'll scroll. Maybe not doom scroll, but I'll go on and I'll, I'll consume some things. If I'm going there to connect, it's into the DMs of the people that I want to connect with. If I'm going there to create, yeah, post and ghost, exactly that. It's you get that post up, you close that application and you go on about your other stuff. Because that's the whole thing is like when we're having all of these little fears about all these different things, when we're focusing on all these, these micro problems, we're not, it stops us from actually going out and doing things. And, you know, I don't think personal development is a tool of the corporate, what's the word, capitalist propaganda machine or anything like that. We've always wanted personal development. It's why, you know, the Stone Age people built sharper weapons and built things to actually chop down trees. It's why Minecraft actually happened in real life just over millennia rather than over a weekend. You know, we got the stone, we got the wood to chop this to, to, to make the stone, and we got the stone to make the stone so we could make the stone pickaxe. And yeah, these all happened so we could make the metal, and then the metal helped us do all this. Personal development, that was long before the ideas of capitalism and all the rest of that kicked in. We've always wanted to excel like not for any other reason than it feels good to excel at things. So we when, when we kind of take on all of these micro dramas, we're not, there's, there's a great book called The Subtle Arts of Not Giving a Fuck. And basically it's in, in the absence of having anything real to give a fuck about, you'll give a fuck about just about anything. Yeah. It's part and parcel with the fact that we've opened up the door for decadence which we consider these devices and we've destroyed our own innocence on the aspect of now we're kind of spending way too much time festering with a problem like you were saying instead of talking with someone and then getting a different reaction of like oh i never even thought of myself like that you know that's a good thing thank you but we sit in our own heads and we go to the negativity side of it and let it burrow into us and to the point where we feel like we're nothing and we're useless and that's when it pushes you to a point where you might do something drastic and in the future, I'm hoping, honestly, in the next 10 years that there's going to be a giant awakening. I know there's a lot of advocacy for mental health now, but I feel like a lot of it is emptiness. You know, there's a lot of people out here that say that they're a mental health advocate in their bio, but they're not really. I know plenty of people, like a, a potential guest that I was going to get, that uh, it was like, yeah, like me and you talk. We had a time set, everything like that. But then they just kept messaging me and messaging me and messaging me and messaging me like 80 times in a row. And I'm like, all right, there's something else going on here. So I clicked on their profile. Their profile was made in December of 2020. It is February. Mm -hmm. They had 40 something thousand tweets. And I was looking through. I was like, how the hell did you get to that number that fast? Every five, 10 seconds was a tweet at Trump or tweet at something like that. I'm like, oh, there's a bigger issue here. There's something else <laughs> going on. And she had told me like, hey, I have mental health problems. Don't make fun of me. And I said, I'm not making fun of you. I put a message saying, we'll talk soon. I'm at work. I'll get back to you later. She said, mm -hmm. are you making fun of me? Because I had mental illness. That's what she said as her reply to that. Right. And I, I lost my lid. I went, what do you mean? Like, I was like, stop, don't use that as a crutch. You can't use that as an excuse. I'm not even there, there's, I didn't even say anything. All I said was I'm at work. And yeah. she goes, oh, and then took my screenshot thing of saying, don't use mental illness as a crutch. I have mental illness too. Then she put that on social media and I had a bunch of people coming at me. And then they all looked at my profile and were like, wait a minute, this guy is not like you made him out to be. And I was like, thank you for doing your fucking <laughs> research. Like it's that simple to misconstrue things on social media. I have no hatred towards that person. I don't care. I just told her I didn't have time to deal with it. If you're going to keep wanting this fight, keep going weeks and weeks afterwards. I'm sorry. Go find somebody else. And she did. She started going towards uh, some comedian that said something in a podcast. But I'm like, it's that. There are people out there that just, I don't know why that's their fix, but I don't want everyone to get to that point where that's where they need to experience. Cause then you're going to start having interactions with people that are always going to be really bad. And it's going to scare you from ever making an interaction ever again. Yeah. It was one of those, one of the things that I've seen a lot and it's, it, I would say Twitter's definitely the social media that's the most guilty of this is the fact that 
you'll you'll obviously you'll be able to you'll find a lot more people talking openly about mental illness on there which is which is good but then some of the people because I, I i i generally try and you know write as, at least a supportive message or something if i see something even if it's not someone i know if it's come up in my feed i'll usually write a supportive message of some description um and then like some people I'll end up following them. And then obviously you see how you see their, their feed after that. And then you will see that that person has spent their entire day on Twitter. Now, here, here's the thing, right? I, I tried to take my own life 11 years ago. And the thing is that I got to a point in my life. The reason I did that is I got to a point in my life where I basically screwed up everything I'd done then sunk further into my depression. And as I sunk further into my depression, suddenly started losing the capabilities of looking after myself and looking after other people. I have two kids. They were three and five at the time. Uh, well, two and four actually at the time. And um, I couldn't look after them. I couldn't feed them. I couldn't, I couldn't keep their clothes clean and stuff. Not because I didn't know how to cook or I didn't know how to clean, just because I literally felt like I had nothing left to give in this world. And that's why I say that like, self-efficacy is such an important thing that when we get to that position we may we may judge ourselves against not being able to be the best person in the world but we need to work on at least feeling in ourselves like we're we're doing better than we were yesterday and i know that's not possible every single day i actually hate that's the quote that says only compare you, don't compare yourself to other people only compare yourself to who you were yesterday because i know lots of people who like get injuries or they actually have nervous breakdowns and stuff and if that person compares themselves to who they were yesterday that only works when you're on the way up but i feel like we do we need a certain degree of self-mastery because otherwise it leads to something called learned helplessness the idea that we cannot we cannot overcome now if you've got a million problems, well, let's just go with a hundred problems rather than a million. But if you've got a hundred problems and you sit and your attitude is I can overcome this and you believe that, you may overcome those problems one at a time and it may take the rest of your life to overcome those problems. And some of them you may never overcome, but you will feel as if you are. And what how we feel is ultimately about what this is all about, right? Um, whereas if you kind of believe 100% that, you will never overcome those things or you're incapable of overcoming those things, then you, it's going to put you in the mindset of I'm going to live the rest of my life like this or it's only going to get worse. And now that's, that's genuinely 100% how I felt. And I, I, I made a video about on, around about the 11th anniversary of, of my suicide attempt. I made a video basically called um, 11 things that I've achieved in the 11 years since I tried to take my own life. And I started the video off by saying, look, I need you to understand that I was in a position 11 years ago where I genuinely felt I had nothing left to give. I genuinely felt like I could never get any better, that I'd never be able to look after my kids. Like I'd never be able to look after myself. And, you know, the things I've done since then are just, and I'm not even done yet. Like, that's like, I'm, I'm not even remotely done yet. You know, it's like, it's, there's, there's so much more still to do, but we, it starts off it starts off. I I know the actually the thing that switched my mindset because I actually still after a try after a, you know the failed suicide attempt I actually still wanted to kill myself. Um, and I was watching a film called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, and it's a true story about a French guy who had um, ALS, and he's there. He's basically been given permission to. He wrote a book through blinking, so he blink with a nurse, and then she'd use that as a way to write this book. And um, he, he, he did manage to agree a day to the beach with his, his wife and his kids. And, it, you know, his wife and his kids are obviously able to be there running around. He's in the chair. He's, he can only move. He can't, can't, sorry, can't move. He can only look and watch what's going on. And there's a line that came up that said, I realize that even a shadow, even a sliver of a dad is still a dad. And I've been feeling like a sliver of a dad for a, a good sort of nine months of the past year at this point. And that kind of hit me like a ton of bricks, you know, like, cause I'm like, okay, I felt that I've got, I can't be their dad because I've only got, and I realized I've got this sliver. I've got this fragment still left. And that's that fragment, that sliver, and there's potential to be more from that. And I've gone from thinking, why can't I be a better, um, I've gone from thinking, why can't I be a better dad for my kids? Which obviously the answer was get out the way and let someone else emerge, right? Um, which is stupid looking back, but didn't feel stupid at the time. Felt like the most logical thing in the whole world in my head back then. And it went from that to how could I? Why can't I be that person? I could be that person. That person could be me. 
And um, it started off with being better for them. And then eventually it became being better. Well, then it became being better for my new partner. And then it became being better for the rest of my friends. And then eventually, eventually, you know, only about five years ago or something, figured out that self-esteem. It's about being better for yourself. Self-esteem's got a bit of a big clue in there. It's got the word self at the beginning of it, but we spend our entire lives looking for approval of other people so that we can feel good about ourselves. That's what each of those people's look, you know, as I do it back to it. It's not attention, really. It's connection, validation. They're not just looking for attention. Atten- attention for what? When we say we want mental health awareness, what do we, we don't want mental health awareness because just everyone in the world knowing that depression is real. What does that achieve for anybody? We're okay. We all know that depression is real now. What do we want by a mental health awareness? We want awareness of how to treat someone with depression. We want awareness of how to help someone with depression. We want awareness of how to be supportive for someone with depression or how to look after depression if we find it ourselves. That's what we want. We don't want awareness. We want improvement. We don't want attention. We want connection or interaction or help. But it's the fast food version of it. You know, we want, we, we kind of, we don't know. Now, the, this, the, how, how I actually know this for is um, the last thing I did the last thing I did before the suicide attempt was I put out on Facebook, I need a hug. I burnt all my bridges over the course of the last year to be in a relationship with somebody and I'd literally lost all my friends, lost my job, lost my family, everything. Um, So I drove home 45 minutes from Liverpool to where I live and the hug hadn't come. No one had responded. Now in my head at that point, I'm like, that's all the proof I need that there's nobody there for me. I believe that same thing. What I've learned now with hindsight and all that is I wasn't looking for attention. I was looking for connection. And there's probably three people I wanted a connection from at that exact moment. One, stupidly, the girl that I'd given everything up for because I was still in love at that point. Two, my mum, who I wasn't speaking to at that point. And three, my best friend, Stu, who who I wasn't speaking to at that point. After I let, you know, after I ended up in hospital from all of this, I left the hospital, like ran away from the hospital, um, and ended up on my friend Stu's doorstep and I turned around to him and I said, look, I know we're not speaking right now, but I really need you. Now, the thing is, he took me back to the hospital and looked after me. He continued to care for me in the weeks after that and all the rest of it. Took me to the cinema to see Inglorious Bastards and treated me like a normal human being one of the days, which is still an absolutely amazing thing. Um, and this is the thing, if instead of the shotgun approach of getting attention, which would have been posted to social media, there's 500 people on there, surely one of them will answer. No, the more people you shout to, the less people will answer. Because if someone shouts or asking for help in a crowded street, everyone else in that street thinks someone else is going to do this. If someone shouts help and you're the only person on that street, you'll probably go and help. Now, if I'd have messaged you and just said, look, I know we're not speaking at the minute, but I'm really struggling right now and I need you. He'd have come over. We'd have made, we'd have probably got back our friendship. We'd have, um, he's still my best friend now. Um, he's like, he was the best man at my wedding. He's, you know, I love him to bits. And, um, but we could have had that because what I was looking for was not attention. It was connection. And it was connection from maybe three people. If I'd have messaged my mum, I'd have probably got the connection, but I'd have also probably got, I don't know, told off of what I was thinking for. Um, if I'd have messaged you, I'd have probably got the connection. If I'd have messaged the ex, probably got told to go fuck myself. But um, so, but I had a two out of three chance there, um, but I didn't. I went for the Facebook approach, but I can 100% hand on my heart say I wasn't looking for connect- and attention. I, I, didn't want, I didn't want people to know Dave wants to kill himself. I wanted it's it's what does Dave wants to kill himself mean? You know, it's like so if someone's putting out on social media that they're really struggling, or if someone's putting out on social media, even if someone like wants you to like pictures of their cat, whatever, what does that mean? What does that mean that person really needs? That's we need to find the thing behind the thing, you know. Yeah. I couldn't think of anything better to end on, Dave. That was Dave, you're a <laughs> fucking superstar, bro. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna so toss that out there. Man. This has been fun. Uh, where can people find you at Dave, man? Seriously. I, I appreciate you giving me your time today too. Uh, no worries. Um, basically mindset by Dave on every social media, the two that I would really point people towards at the minute would be Twitch, twitch.tv slash mindset by Dave. Um, I'm actually running a 26 hour mental health stream next week. So I'm, I'm interviewing 26 people back to back. Um, so new, new guest every hour, having a conversation about mental health, your time, that'll be from 2 PM 
Eastern um, on Friday the 26th until 5 p.m. Eastern. My time, it's 7 p.m. till 10 p.m. Um, I've got a couple of Americans on there, a couple of American mental health advocates, basically mental health advocates from around the world, all like 26 of us all having a conversation. So that's twitch.tv slash mindset by Dave and then youtube.com slash mindset by Dave, where there are mini sort of eight minute to 12 minute long videos about specific mental health topics and mindset topics. Well, I'll make sure I link it all in the description. And thank you for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast.